Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a unique list of 10 miracles. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic, 10 amazing accomplishments at the cross. It was the darkest day in history, but it was also the sunrise of hope. It was the horror of the murder of heaven's lovely man, and yet the triumph of Judah's prince leading captivity captive. Stand with us at the cross for a few minutes and see 10 thrilling truths that forever change the history of the human race. A little different from our other lists, but it hopefully will stir up the love for our champion. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. Truly an exciting list of 10 here today. Our first one is that at the cross, it was the fulfillment of a multitude of remarkable prophecies. Right, John 19, 36 says, these things were done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. It's a moving thing to think the Lord Jesus hung a little longer on the cross just for the fulfillment of little verses like, I thirst. The number of prophecies, the time lapse between the prophecies and the fulfillment, and the improbability of them happening naturally, and the specificity of details moves it beyond any chance of coincidence and shows that these are true divine prophecies. And our second one, many Old Testament types found their antitype in Christ's sacrifice. Now, what does that all mean? Well, God put these prototypes in the Old Testament that were waiting to find their complete fulfillment in Christ. Uh, just a few of them, the Passover lamb, which emphasized Christ's perfection and his substitutionary work. Uh, the Red Sea crossing, which uh, the New Testament says that we're saved not by water only, but by water and blood. They were not only saved in Egypt, but they were saved out of Egypt, and it showed the victory over their foes uh, in, the, in the sea. And then the tree that was cut down and thrown into the bitter waters at Mara, showing how Christ sweetens the experiences of life. And of course, the uh, smitten rock from which the river flowed, and the scripture teaches us that that river is the Holy Spirit of God. The bronze serpent, which is a strange one. We might think God would have told Moses to put a lamb there, but the idea is that Christ had to be made in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And then, of course, the manna from heaven, the bread of God, which he gave to satisfy our soul. So these are all beautiful Old Testament pictures that are answered in the cross of Christ. What's amazing is how many there must be. Uh, the examples you gave are all just from the first uh, little section. Exactly. Uh, number three, the absolute claims of the law of God were satisfied. Yes, this is one of the reasons why God just couldn't forgive us. Judicially, as the judge, he had to deal with the effects of sin. And so we read here, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And number four, both the wrath of God for sin and his love for sinners was fully revealed. There are people who say that some people have to go to hell just so God can show the fullness of his wrath. But that happened at Calvary when every bit of God's wrath was expended against the Lord Jesus and he took it all and satisfied God's righteous wrath but he also manifested God's perfect love and here we have this great a dichotomy of the love of God for sinners but his hatred for their sin both fulfilled at the cross. And number five, a ransom sufficient to redeem every sinner for every sin was made. The Bible says the price was so lavish 
that it made the richest person in the universe poor through its expense. Uh, the Lord himself told the story how for joy he gave up all that he had in order to buy this possession. And it's a remarkable truth that the Lord Jesus is a propitiation not for our sins only, but for the whole world, 1 John 2.2. 2. And then number six says, the world was there crucified to me as was my old man to the world. Right, when we see those three crosses, let's imagine for a minute that actually it's not only the Lord Jesus dying for me there, but the Lord Jesus dealing with this enemy called the world. The world is the place where people are trying to be happy without God. The world of religion, the world of economics and politics and culture, and it's an enemy of God. It's an attempt to be satisfied apart from God. And says the Apostle Paul, the world was crucified there to me. I see the world for what it really is. Don't go to Hollywood or Wall Street. Go to, go to Calvary and you'll see the world for what it is. And there it was crucified to me. That's the end of the plans that I have for the world and that the world has for me because I was crucified there too. We were crucified with Christ. So all that I was before Christ, B.C., it's over with. And the old man, that is what I was before Christ, has been crucified at the cross. That's an interesting perspective we don't usually get when, when we're looking at the cross. That's uh, helpful in our current struggle. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then number seven, uh, the massive foundation was laid to sustain the church and the world to come. I don't think people realize what a seismic shift there was in the world when Adam and Eve sinned. Essentially, the main spar, the main foundation that holds the universe together is trust, and it's trust in God. And when people lose trust in their creator, the whole thing comes crashing down. So one of the reasons the Lord Jesus came was to lay his glory in the dust and to become a new foundation for this new world that is to come. And we are built on the foundation of Christ. As the apostle said, other foundation can no one lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. And so the church, the coming kingdom, the world to come, is all based on this trust that we regained in God through the sacrifice of Christ. Who can't trust somebody who would die for you? And number eight, Satan the serpent, our chief adversary, was crushed at Calvary. This is the first promise that God gave actually to the devil himself that a day was coming when the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. And so while the devil is still causing havoc in the world, he's been knocked from his horse and his crown's in the dust. He's a defeated foe, and it's only a matter of time until he's cast out of this world. So how grateful we are, as Hebrews 2.14 says, that through death Christ might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And number nine, Christ miraculously released us from death's fear and turned it for our good. Now, how does he turn death to our good? Yeah, this was the ultimate damage, separation from God and everything that God is. He's everything we need. And we were separated from him, from the life of God. And so the Lord Jesus, when he came in reconciling us to God, he also took death in its own domain and defeated it and turned it into a servant. So much so that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, death is yours. And what probably one of the greatest miracles that ever occurred, the Lord Jesus turned death to such good that every blessing that I can trace goes back to death. Either the death of Christ, my physical death, which will introduce me into the heaven and the world to come, or my spiritual death when I put to death the flesh with its affections and lusts and live in the good of God's salvation now. So the bondage of sin, 
that, that was the power of death, the sting of sin, and the hopelessness of death has gone. And so while we grieve when a loved one dies, the Bible says we don't grieve as others who have no hope. And so even death has become a servant, like a doorman that opens the door for us into the presence of God. And then finally, number 10, the whole world is drawn to the cross, either in salvation or condemnation. The Lord Jesus promised in John 12, 32, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. The preachers used to say that, that the cross is the watershed of two eternities. And every human being in history, their eternal fate is determined by where they stand relative to the cross. If they reject God's message of hope, the Bible tells us that they will then bear the curse that Christ bore for them. They will be separated from God because Christ is the only one who could reconcile us to him. On the other hand, those who put their faith in what God says, that trust in God, that call on the name of the Lord to be saved, they come into the good of the cross work of Christ and all the benefits that accrue to us when we know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might be rich. The story of the cross is the story of the love of God and the provision of Christ and the opening up of the ministry of the Holy Spirit when the rock was smitten the river of God flowed, and all the benefits we enjoy, we trace back to Calvary. No wonder we happily gather weekly to focus on this, to declare his death, and to remember him. This is the greatest love story in the history of the world. <laughs>